Hello, I'm Lynn McLean, Director of EMR Australia, and today I'm pleased to be talking with Dr. Ollie Johansson. Dr. Johansson was, until his retirement, Associate Professor at Sweden's prestigious Karolinska Institute. He's author of 350 scientific publications, many of them on the impacts of electromagnetic fields on the immune system. His work has been enormously important in understanding how electromagnetic fields affect the skin in particular, and has contributed to an understanding of why some people experience symptoms when they're exposed. Dr. Johansson has kindly agreed to talk with me today about how electromagnetic fields affect immunity, and I'm delighted to welcome him. Welcome, Ollie. Well, thank you very much indeed. It's such a great honor to be on your program today, and I look forward to discuss uh, the findings because um, many of them, I think, are very important and, oddly enough, being done in the 1980s and 90s, suddenly with the ongoing corona question around the world and flu symptoms and whatnot, uh, I do understand people make comparisons to what happens when you're exposed to electromagnetic fields. So we might have some speculative discussions at the end, you know. Well, that sounds very interesting. Certainly immunity is a big factor for all of us at the moment worldwide. And I think that everybody would agree that it's important for us to be keeping our immunity uh, at top function. So if there are things that we can do to achieve that and risks that we can avoid, that's good to know about. So I'd like to go back uh, to some of your early work and you observed the differences in the skin of people who, were, who had electromagnetic hypersensitivity and those without when they were exposed to fields from a regular TV. So can you tell us what that study was about? Yeah, um, you know, you have to remember at that time, um, I mean, I was of course a professional in the field of neuroscience, but when it came to uh, the skin and to the immune system, I often found myself needing to learn. And uh, luckily enough, I had quite a number of colleagues that at the right time popped into my laboratory, knowing nothing what we were doing, but pointing to, for instance, micrographs of skin biopsies from people uh, with electron hypersensitivity and asking us, wow, are you taking samples from people with a very active immune system reacting to some allergens? And then I remember I would say, why, why do you say that? Well, look at these images you have here of the so-called dendritic cells of the dermis of the human skin. And there are so very many here and they are very, very activated. So that's my reason why I ask you. It looks as if uh, there is an ongoing flu, for instance. And I said, wow, um, you know, we are looking at a new group of persons called electron hypersensitive. They claim to react against electromagnetic fields and when they are exposed, they report very much flu-like symptoms, uh, an unease in the entire body, uh, aches from the joints, from the muscles, and a feeling of uh, illness. And then these physicians would say, well, yeah, there you are. That's what you see in these images. And based upon that, we decided to put initially only two persons with electron hypersensitivity in an open exposure, meaning that they would see the television set. Uh, and we had just taken away the sound to not disturb the discussion. And to make a long story short, uh, in this uh, provocation study, uh, the first lady, she would sit there for an hour uh, and then we would take biopsies and look in the microscope for different cell types. And then we saw uh, that she also had this very, very dense network of these dendritic cells, but also a colossal number 
of uh, mast cells uh, and mast cells being the common denominator for clinical uh, reaction patterns such as allergies, other types of oversensitivities, asthma and so on. Uh, so it uh, did fit with what they had reported from their own personal point of view. And, um, but you know, as I said, I was an amateur uh, because when we had exposed this lady um, to this television set, seemingly the dendritic cells had just disappeared. It was completely empty. So I said to my collaborators, my younger students that no, you must have done something wrong. There is just no way that the cells can disappear. So no, you have to go back and ask this woman if she can participate once again. And this time you have to make it correct, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I was very harsh on the students and they did, they did exactly that. And the next time she would sit for only half the time, half an hour. And then she said, no, I cannot take it any longer. I, I react so very much. And um, the pattern was exactly the same. All these dendritic cells had just completely gone. And uh, then I had to slowly start to realize that maybe there wasn't any technical error being uh, introduced into the experiment, but something had happened. And of course it was tempting to think as many physicians at the time did that this woman was just imagining the situation. And uh, when she saw this household television set around 50 centimeters from uh, her body, she would get afraid and react and the cells would disappear in some odd manner, you know. But then we took the other woman and um, she sat in the exact same exposure situation, half a meter from a household television set. Uh, and uh, she sat there, I don't quite remember, it was many hours, uh, but eventually she said, you know, Ole, I can sit here forever. Uh, but I have to go back home now. I'm waiting for my husband to come home and uh, he is expecting me to be there and our children and so on. So I have to leave. And I was close to letting her go without taking the second biopsy so I could check before and after exposure because I felt if she didn't react, she didn't feel anything, mm -hmm. what's the use of the biopsy? But we took it. And then the other thing was that when we looked in the microscope, all these immune system uh, related dendritic cells, they were gone. Uh, just as is in, yeah, mm -hmm. just as the first woman, you know, but without any subjective reaction, no sensation, no feeling of illness, nothing. So, so obviously the cells were reacting to something in the exposure situation. And then of course, you cannot use any psychological explanation because then you need the subjective reaction pattern. You need the person to say, oh, I'm feeling ill, but she didn't. She said she could sit there forever, you know, but the yeah. cells had reacted to something and blimey, you know, the only thing we could think about was of course the electromagnetic fields. Uh, and um, it, it was, as you imagine, sensational. Just as a sidetrack, the in, mast cells being very many, they were still very many. They seemingly hadn't reacted, uh, but being electrohypersensitive, of course she would react uh, and claim reactions to everything in society every electromagnetic installation. Uh, and when we looked in the microscope, the pattern of the cells, they were identical to what you would see if you had subjected yourself to radioactivity, like from Fukushima or um, Chernobyl or Harrisburg, um, and, or if you had subjected yourself to X-rays or very strong ultraviolet light, but of course, in this room, there was no radioactive isotopes. There were no X-rays, no ultraviolet light. So it was just the same reaction pattern. Uh, and that also led us to 
sort of base our research on a hypothetical model saying that no, these uh, persons, they were not imagining anything. They were not postmenopausal because many of them were men. Uh, they were not uh, uh, having a low educational um, level because many were lawyers, professors, politicians, uh, medical doctors, and so on, you know, and so on, so on. All these explanatory models used by pre clinicians didn't work at all. And uh, the only thing uh, we could uh, sort of get our head around was that this was a classical radiation damage. It wasn't because of radioactivity from plutonium or radium, but it was the non-ionizing radiation from the uh, television sets later on, from computer screens, from cell phones and the Wi-Fi routers, etc. And that model is still our working model. Um, based upon this initial uh, investigation, uh, then of course, I mean, we, we felt um, very excited to say the least, you know, it was really sensational. It was very easy to publish the paper because the journal, they were also very excited about the results. And at that time, and we're talking about the 1980s, society hadn't really reacted yet. We were met with um, praise and interest and uh, acknowledgements and colleagues came up and said that we were doing very important studies. But um, from the beginning of the 1990s, then something happened and the situation became the opposite. Uh, the opposition was enormous. And very soon we ran out of all governmental funding and all support and it, it was an sort of beginning of a very, very hard time. And I really would like to thank anyone listening to your program because many people have been kind and given us support, economic support. Uh, and that's very, very important. And we are still trying our hardest to continue these studies and uh, maybe we, we will be able. But uh, based upon what we found, uh, then we initiated a number of different investigations and coming back to your question, uh, then we took um, uh, normal healthy volunteers um, and uh, we took medical and dental students and then we placed them uh, in front of ordinary household television sets and ordinary household computer screens again at the viewing distance of about 40 centimeters, they sat with their back to these screens uh, so that they couldn't um, sort of self inflict any reactions. Uh, and um, we took skin biopsies on their back before, during and after this uh, exposure provocation study. And uh, again, to make a long story short, it turned out uh, that many of these students, and they were only allowed to sit there, uh, they could drink water, they could read, but that was it. And then they should report if they had any form of um, subjective uh, sensations or feelings uh, of illness or reactions, anything. And <laughs> oddly enough, the only thing was that a few students reported that it was boring to sit with the back to these computer screens and television sets. But apart from that, no subjective reactions whatsoever, nothing. But again, when we compared skin biopsies already after two hours, which was the first biopsy time point, uh, we had a dramatic increase in the number of the histamine and heparin containing mast cells, the key cells for reactions towards your environment and uh, the cells that will throw you into allergy uh, rages or um, asthma um, uh, situations, they had very, very clearly reacted. And the difference uh, was very highly significant from a statistical point of view. Uh, and again, 
I remember we were very, very surprised because at that time we thought that, okay, electro hypersensitive people, it makes sense that they react at the cellular and molecular level, but normal healthy volunteers by definition being healthy should not react. So we didn't expect that, but they did. So again, of course, today I cannot help myself seeing especially young uh, people being glued to their smartphones and tablets, laptops, cell phones, decked phones, whatever, exposing themselves constantly more or less. How is their immune system really reacting and how do they actually feel and maybe the feelings are not at the brain level but it's going on in your body and i'm very sure that's the case because uh, i did another study i uh, looked at the immune system reaction uh, at various immune cell types uh, during provocations uh, being done by other investigators and again by compiling all the information, I could see that our immune system initially reacts to uh, the electromagnetic signals as they would react to any allergy into pollen or nickel or whatever. But after some time, they cannot fight out this constant exposure. So the immune system is deteriorating and loses its capacity to really fight off this. And as you know, uh, when you talk to electron hypersensitive people, they talk a lot about the um, sort of wear down feeling. Uh, they are constantly feeling ill. They are constantly feeling um, tired and, and uh, they are trying to lift their immune system by uh, eating oranges, eating vegetables, doing any, but it doesn't help. Uh, and maybe it's because the uh, exposure is, of course, 24 seven, wherever they live, wherever they go to school or wherever where they work. And uh, so they are constantly exposed. And maybe you have the same situation regarding normal healthy volunteers. And I don't know where you live, how the situation is, but here in Sweden, uh, when we look, for instance, about asthma and allergy, more than half of the um, young kids up to the age of 14 have at least one uh, allergy or one asthma type. Uh, so it's a colossal increase. When I was a kid, uh, it was less than 0.5% of the population. And today it's over one third of the Swedish population. Mm, goodness. And yeah, and you know, it's just shocking when you see these figures and, um, I'm surprised that uh, society doesn't react. But of course, if you're prone for conspiracy theories, as it's called, uh, all these persons, they are at the same time patients and they will eat a lot of pharmaceutical medicines, drugs of different types. So it's a gigantic win-win situation for the pharmaceutical industry and here in Sweden, it's also a win-win situation for the government because we tax uh, the pharmaceutical industry. And um, so suddenly all these dramatic increases in patient numbers also yields income at various levels of society. And I'm not saying that's the driving force in any way, uh, but maybe it could be uh, the blocking force, why it's so very, very difficult to get the necessary funding to do these simple uh, tests and experiments. And um, I mean, with, with uh, uh, no disrespect, I mean, I should not be sitting here talking to you. I should be in a laboratory. I should do the investigations. I should check out all the question marks. And again, I would like to thank you, but also all of your viewers and listeners, because lay persons around the planet, they send questions and suggestions to me that are brilliant. They are just brilliant, you know, but I always have to say, well, sorry, 
uh, we would love to investigate your hypotheses, but we cannot. We don't have the necessary resources. So we sit more or less stuck here. And, uh, but not, not all of it is, um, how do you say, dark. Uh, there are also glimmers of hope. And uh, right now we are trying to start uh, a project regarding pollinators, especially honeybees, mm -hmm. because as you know, there are already studies pointing to that honeybees should not buy and use cell phones uh, because they don't like uh, the exposure, not at all. And we would love to replicate these studies and also to expand them by adding more questions. And um, we have sent an application to a governmental authority here in Sweden. And I hope, I hope, you know, that we will be able to get some funding. Of course, the chances are very small. And also it's very ironic because during the application process, we found out that uh, there are companies that now have developed various wireless and monitoring systems to be set into the beehives. Oh yeah, so you see, I mean, and they are also applying for research money to expand their ideas. So for this governmental authority, they will have to pick should we go for the industry or for Ule Johansson and his collaborators, you know? Um, so it's a tricky situation really, but we, we will have to just keep up our hopes, of course. Well, that's right. And I think that things will change. And I think that people are becoming more interested in this issue now, as unfortunately more and more people are being affected. And, and that includes bees, more and more bees seem to be um, affected by this radiation too, well, there's more and more evidence of that. So just for people who might know, uh, there are some studies that are showing that when you put a wireless device like a mobile phone in or near a hive, that the bees start to behave differently. And sometimes they, they go into behaviors that are typical of swarming behaviors and uh, sometimes abandon the hive. So there is the hypothesis that this radiation may be a contributing factor for the decline in, in bee numbers, which seems to be happening worldwide. So- And also at dramatic uh, levels, you know, the reductions are just colossal. So something needs to be done very quickly. And the question is, should we then put wireless gadgets into the beehives or should we allow Will you want them to investigate uh, the previous findings? So. Yes. Well, I hope that you're successful with that, Alisa. I hope you'll keep <laughs> us informed. But um, I'm, I'm so fascinated about your research on skin. And it's very interesting that what you're saying is that your findings show allergic type responses to this exposure. So is it going too far to say that we could see this radiation as an allergy? Uh, well, that's a very, very good question, you know, and remember that in Sweden, when these persons first arrived, and they were not the first, and uh, that was actually in the United States and in Norway, and then Sweden followed a few years later, uh, but still they were called electrical allergy patients, and clinicians would laugh because they felt that was so ridiculous, you know. Yes. Uh, but maybe they shouldn't have left because as you say, uh, all the reaction patterns we see in our microscopes, uh, they are exactly the same you would anticipate in a classical allergy reaction. And the allergy in this time is not nickel or pollen. It's instead the electromagnetic fields, the artificial uh, pulsed modulated uh, electromagnetic fields that we use for very fun communication, uh, enabling us to talk now, for instance. Uh, uh, so they are very useful, but they could have then backsides we need to find out quickly, I would say. Well, Oli, I'm going to show you something and I don't know whether you can see it, but yes, just in case people don't know what this is, this is a landline phone and I have <laughs> wired 
wired only internet here so i'm not using any radiation in this conversation everything is perfectly safe and the same for me i could bend over and lift my receiver here you know and it's also wired so i don't use it but probably between us there will be wireless connective places you know so probably we are using wireless without even knowing it oh well at least yeah. at least in the situations where we are we're not exposing no, exactly. ourselves yeah, exactly. so it is it is possible um, the other thing that i find fascinating about what you're saying is that some people are reacting without knowing it so that begs the question how many people out there in the, the wider community might be being affected by this radiation but not knowing it because the effects are on their body but they're not conscious of it mentally exactly. and and um i mean we are not the only ones of course to have done experiments here i'm thinking for instance about Igor Belyaev and his collaborators, mm -hmm. we investigate lymphocytes, which are also part of the immune system from normal healthy volunteers and from electro hypersensitive people. And they both reacted in the same way. Uh, the difference being that the electro hypersensitive persons would be aware of that something was wrong. And therefore, as you probably have read, I have contemplated the possibility that actually the electro hypersensitive persons, they are the normal ones. They have a normal avoidance reaction to a toxic environment. Whereas people like myself, who is not electro hypersensitive, I am actually electro hyposensitive. I am not reacting as the yellow canary bird in the coal mine. And therefore I'm risking my health in quite another way because the electro hypersensitive people they will not buy and use all these wireless gadgets but stay away as will very poor people in the world uh, living in poor people without the infrastructure without the money without the need even for all these laptops and tablets and cell phones and maybe maybe they are tomorrow's winners you know uh, mm -hmm. it sounds dramatic but uh, it's a fair question because there are some uh, results that definitely keep me awake in nighttime. And one of them is, of course, the dramatic reduction of sperm cells uh, that you see in the modern industrialized Western world. And uh, when um, scientists have exposed sperm cells to radiation from uh, cell phones, again, they should not buy and use uh, these kind of cell phones because the sperm cells don't like the radiation. They deteriorate, they swim badly, uh, and their lifetime is reduced, etc., etc. So the experiment in the test tube shows what is now documented worldwide with this very strong reduction in male sperm cell quality. And also there, we would love to do replications and further experiments, not having the money. Uh, here I say it again, you know. Uh, and also another area which we are very interested in is, of course, bacteria. And I'm thinking particularly about the studies by Tahiri and co-workers in the United States, who in 2017 published a study where they had subjected ordinary bacteria, bacteria you and I have on us and in us right now uh, to old fashioned uh, second generation GSM cell telephony and also to modern Wi-Fi router radiation. And uh, not very much happened with the bacteria apart from one thing. And that's the thing that keeps me awake in nighttime. They became antibiotic resistant. Mm. The very same year, 2017, without knowing about Tahiri and co-workers and their results, the G20 countries had a separate meeting here in Europe only about the fact that around 25,000 Europeans die prematurely because of antibiotic resistance in healthcare. And at that meeting, 
Uh, it was discussed that around 2050 worldwide, about 10 million people each year will die prematurely because of antibiotic resistance. But if you take Tahiri and you take the G20 countries and merge them together, then the 10 million could easily become 7.7 .7 billion people. Because if our antibiotics doesn't work any longer, then we will start to die from a splinter in your thumb as they did at the end of the 19th century. It's a fairly horrific thought, isn't it? So, yeah. I, so. I guess that brings us back to that the idea of our immune systems are so important and at this particular time in history where we're assaulted by all sorts of problems and if antibiotic resistance is something that's that's taking place it seems to behove us to be really looking after our immune systems and building them up and from what you're saying wireless radiation electromagnetic fields are having a fairly obvious negative impact on the immune system so it stands to reason that what we should be doing is reducing our exposure to these fields. Does that sound reasonable to you? Yeah, absolutely. And that's what I also tell people. Uh, and um, not only looking at your cell phone or laptop, but walk around in your home or at your workplace and ask these simple questions. Do I have to brush my teeth with an electric toothbrush or could I do it manually? Do I have to whip the cream with an electric equipment or can I do it by hand, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know, and try to reduce all these unnecessary exposures as much as you can. And then also, of course, at the other end, increase the amount of outdoor um, uh, exercise um, walk um, uh, engage in sports, bicycle, whatever, and go out into nature and, and fill your body with positive energy and positive experiences and also eat very well. And only um, as I have here, uh, drink water. This is actually water, you know. Oh, uh, so so drink water. Yeah. yeah, all these so sodas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you see, all these, uh, you know, sweet sodas and so on. You don't need that. Yeah, yes. just skip it, you know, mm -hmm. and eat healthy as much as you can. And I have some friends, particularly from India, that are brilliant in thinking about what you should eat and drink. And I'm learning by the minute, I would say. And also a very old dog like me can <laughs> actually be taught to sit, you know, so you, you can too. change your life. Oh, absolutely. And I, I think what we observe is that people have to so I've been in this area now for 25 years. And if I go back 25 years and uh, you were already working in, in this field, then people would contact me. And it, 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 I guess the numbers were very much lower then and they were mainly women. And now I'm contacted all the time by not just women, by men, by young men, young men with families, young men who haven't got families, by lots of people. And often the trigger is a health problem. And it might be that they're not well, or it might be that someone in their family is not well, and they're starting to look for solutions. So I think that's great. But what I'd like to say to people is don't wait till things go wrong and there's a health problem in your family or you're experiencing it. Start to look at what you can do now to to make your environment a healthy one and so that your, your immune system can um, have less stress on it, I guess. Yeah. Could I ask you, since you are really an expert as well, you know, uh, what do you say about, for instance, minerals and vitamins? Should one tell people to add supplements of that type uh, or not? Oh, I think definitely. And I'm not an authority in the area of health at all, but I have a daughter who's a naturopath. And my understanding is that our diets are often very deficient in nutrients, not just because our apples might be kept in cold storage or things like that, but because our soils are depleted and they're not perhaps nourished the way they used to be in the past. So we're not getting the nutrients in our diet that we need and therefore to supplement it makes a lot of sense. 
So yeah. uh, I, I tend and, to... You know, exactly what you tell me now is the reason why I started to think, because recently there was a documentary on the public Swedish television about the soil destruction. It's called The Last Harvest. And when you see it, you are shocked. I mean, the need for all people in the world to get their daily food is understandable. But then, you know, the destruction of the soil and soil quality is just astronomic and it will end badly for sure. And the question is, what can you do in the meantime? But also, I think um, the entire mankind has to rethink the industrial um, uh, farming uh, system. It, it's not uh, sustainable in any way. Uh, so it has to be changed for sure, you know. Yeah, and I think that there are some really good signs of that happening, maybe on a small scale. But I think that people are waking up, which is is encouraging. And what we would like to do in these sessions is to help people become more aware of the problems of electromagnetic fields in their environment. Um, Could I ask and, the, sorry? No, Could I ask the, mention since you mentioned the reduction of exposure uh, as you say there are quite a lot of new um, ideas and and an awakening and also there are new inventions i could just quickly mention that soon there will be a launch of a low radiation level uh, cell phone from poland called mudita and the phone is called mudita pure uh, and where they have tried to reduce the exposure, the personal exposure as much as they can. And um, also I learned recently that many customers in Japan, uh, when they buy a new car, uh, they would demand that there would be a switch where they could indoor switch off all the Wi-Fi systems. Because, you know, Japanese people are very health conscious uh, and they are um, very smart as well, you know, and it's such a simple thing, you just switch it off. And now um, another car manufacturer is looking into uh, producing cars along the same uh, sort of um, line of, of reasoning. And also here in Sweden, we have a company called RP, which stands for Radiation Protection, RP of Sweden. And if you look on the internet, it's rpofsweden.com, I think. And what they sell are very cheap. We're talking about somewhere in the order of um, 40, 50 US dollars um, uh, cases for your cell phone, for your tablet, for baby alarms. You can have for your Wi Fi router, etc., which will reduce the exposure somewhere in the order of between 70 to 90 percent. Some makes and models to 99 percent reduction, and single ones even to 99.9 .9 reduction. So it's a dramatic radiation reduction. Uh, and mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's such a cheap thing to buy. Uh, so I would recommend anyone to actually order such a case for their smartphone or their Wi-Fi router. Uh, and they also have other uh, wireless, um, uh, sort of wire-free, wired, I mean, uh, wired uh, uh, earphones. And they have meters for measuring electromagnetic fields and whatnot. And uh, as I say, there are so simple inventions, but they could maybe make a big difference. Yeah, we have a lot of products that reduce people's exposure too. But what we try to encourage people to do is to use wireless free devices. Because if you reduce your radiation by, you know, 50%, 90%, whatever it is, and there's still some, there's enough yeah. for your device to connect to another device. Therefore, there's enough for that radiation to connect to your brain. Yeah, yeah, well, that, that's very true. Yeah, very so true. if you yeah. can if you can go completely radiation free, which is just so easy to do in lots of situations, then I think that's the for me that's the best um, alternative. I agree. Um, no, I agree to hundred yeah. percent. But you know, many people, especially uh, the electro hypo sensitive normal healthy volunteers, they still want to have the mobile function. 
so they want to have a wired a wireless um, uh, connection mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and uh, therefore they are looking for some exposure reduction and the question as you say is of course will that reduction be enough to protect your health or not and that we don't know well, again we would love to do uh, studies on it but we cannot yeah what we we find um and i've noticed it in the research but I also notice it with people who are contacting me is that there seems to be a problem with cumulative exposure so you can use a mobile phone for one year two year ten years you're absolutely fine absolutely fine and then you hit the tipping point and suddenly you can't tolerate it anymore and we find that that happens a lot with electrosensitive people that they just get to the point where their bodies have had enough and that seems to me to be fitting in with what you're saying that that this radiation is acting as a stressor on the body that the body's reacting whether a person knows or not and then suddenly the immune system says hang on guys i've really had enough and yeah. the the symptoms start so for me that's a really if it's happening that way, that's a really important reason for us to be reducing our exposure. And particularly, yeah, yeah particularly for young kids, because imagine a, yeah. a child who's exposed from the age of, you know, <laughs> six yeah. months or, or minus six months. We don't know what at, at what point that cumulative exposure is going to be enough to trigger reactions. And how is it going to be when they're 40, 50, 60, 70? What yeah. will their health be like then? And, and uh, it's so interesting you mentioned this because I've come across so very many persons that reported that basically from one day to the next, they became electrohypersensitive, just like out of nowhere. And they were loving their life, their work, everything, and bam, suddenly something happened. And it's tempting, as you say, especially when you look into the scientific literature uh, to see that there is a rapid deterioration and a leakage sort of. Suddenly the uh, body cannot hold the radiation out any longer. It cannot deal with it. And wow, then you become electron hypersensitive. Uh, or, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you can have other types of, we haven't even touched upon that. Uh, we, we could have, other types of long-term effects. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about brain tumors, uh, but also, of course, other forms of uh, uh, illnesses like neurological damage, etc. And also, I'm very much concerned about um, concentration capacity difficulties in pupils and students. Uh, you have um, short-term memory losses, uh, you have impacts on the electrical activity of your brain, the electroencephalogram, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know, even including damage to uh, nerve cells and also uh, nerve cell death has been found in very, very uh, detailed studies on mouse uh, in, in laboratories. Uh, and the question is, all our students, kids, et cetera, have we actually given them a cell phone and a brain damage? That's quite right. Yeah, and I could tell you a very quick story. Um, uh, I was out and it's about a year ago, no, a little bit more than a year, traveling here in Stockholm in a commuter train. And since no one knows who I am, you know, I always take the opportunity to educate people and inform them. And there was a very posh lady sitting next to me so I leant over and said, do you know uh, that um, the World Health Organization in Geneva, in Switzerland, has cancer classified the radiation coming from your smartphone? And she went ballistic. She yelled at me to basically go to a warm place and mind my own business. And I didn't know at all what I was talking about and so on, you know. And I said, no, 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 stop, stop, please. You have a smartphone. Couldn't you Google WHO, brain tumor and mobile phone? And she did and went silent mm -hmm. for two, three minutes. And then she looked up and said, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. It's, it's all here, you were right. 
but why have no one informed me about this? You see, I'm not only a mother, I'm also a grandmother. And a week ago, I gave my granddaughter a new cell phone and now I regret it. Uh, and I said, well, you better start uh, reading more and, uh, and uh, getting all the facts straight, you know, because this is a serious question. And then unfortunately I had to leave the train. So I don't know how the story ended, but she looked at me very puzzled. And uh, so again, I tell all your viewers and listeners, uh, what you always can do is to use facts and inform people. Uh, be nice, be kind, and just try to educate them slightly, put the grain into their uh, seed, into their, their brain, and um, maybe something will grow. Uh, oh. Maybe people start thinking more, you know. Oh, absolutely. I, I do believe that's right. And I do believe that people are a lot more aware than they were. So one easy way for people to do that would be to email this blog to their friends. And yeah. that would help to, to spread yeah, the yeah. information yeah. as well. Um, <laughs> no, no. no, it's a very effective way to put, put all these mental seeds into the mental soil. And then, of course, it's up to the person receiving the information to deal with it. But maybe people will start thinking more and more. And uh, I find it more common that people already have pondered some of these questions mm -hmm. uh, and they actually have some information already uh, but i continue to pop up as the little wise guy you know telling them hey have you heard about <laughs> i think i do the same thing Holly. <laughs> so it's good as far as i'm concerned I, I think one of the messages from our conversation today is to that people might think that they're not being affected by this radiation and you call them people who are hypo what was it hypo electromagnetic sensitive yeah electro hypersensitive <laughs> yeah. and and they would think well look i can use my mobile phone i don't get any problems i can do this i can use wi-fi but the message that you're giving us is well maybe that's not right that your body might still be being affected and if we were to take a sample of your skin and analyze it or send it across to ollie to, to analyze that maybe your immune system is reacting to this and maybe that is not good in the, the long term for you. So from that, it suggests to me that maybe everyone should be taking notice, not just people who know that they react, but everybody yeah. out there should be saying, well, if there's a risk that my immune system is compromised, I should be doing something about it. Yeah, and, and you know, you are too kind, Lynn, because... I would probably cross out the word maybe you used a few times. Uh, I think it's very well demonstrated that normal healthy tissues, cells, molecules, organs, and individuals do uh, react to and are affected by the electromagnetic fields. And the question is only what will happen with the health and also in transgenerational health, there are some very scary observations. And all this discussion also maybe is the reason why every insurance and reinsurance company in the world has left and abandoned their ship. They do not in any way take any form of responsibility for health effects of electromagnetic fields all categories yes and and so if it was safe for everyone then they would stay on board but they left it and they left it more than 20 years ago I, and i think that that would be a good thing for our listeners to check and especially if our listeners might be um, in positions of administration check your insurance policy and have a look does your insurance cover you for exposure yeah. to this and in many cases there are exclusion uh, yeah, and, and, and not, not in many, in all places. Mm. Uh, it was unanimously decided that all the companies would leave this area. And it was done more than 20 years ago. And it's not secret in any way. In Sweden, the major newspapers all report, reported about this in big articles. But people, you know, they're always uh, engaged in... Uh, taking selfies and updating their Facebook profiles and photographing their breakfast. 
so they don't see the important information. So if you ask Swedes on the street, they don't have a clue about this. And uh, I remember I was at a meeting in London in 2002. And then for instance, Lloyd's UK were there, uh, Swiss RIA, which is the largest reassurance company in the world and so on and so on. And they all said that for them, there was not the question whether the electromagnetic fields were dangerous or not. They knew they were dangerous. The only question was who is going to pay for the health damages in the future, and they didn't want to do it. No, well, quite. So really. Therefore, they crossed out this from their mm -hmm. small print, you know. And people who are interested in uh, in finding out more about that can either see our website or just Google it. Swiss Re, for example, that's Swiss R E, uh, came out with a, a big report about that, and I think it was 1996 or 97, so quite a long time ago. Yeah, um, yeah. I just also, I hope you don't mind, I just wanted to very quickly mention a study that you did, and I just loved this, where you'd been criticised for doing studies on people, and it had been argued that, well, maybe these people have psychosomatic reactions, in other words, they're worried about exposure, and therefore, the, the mast cells are being activated in their skin. And so you very nicely did a study on rats and you exposed yeah. rats to uh, to these fields. And yeah. I might let you tell the rest of the story. Yeah, the yeah. I mean, you're completely right because when um, especially medical doctors tried to find an explanation, and uh, we said before they were trying to uh, introduce the ideas of postmenopausal reactions and imagination, Pavlovian conditioning, blah, 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 all of different kinds. Um, and then finally, they actually arrived at an explanation that made sense, namely that this was a mass media driven psychosis. When you Lin make a program, then people watching it would start feeling that well, maybe I'm a little bit electro hypersensitive too, but they are not. That would be the explanation. But all of this is so easily investigated by using rats, because with all due respect, rats don't watch your program. They don't read newspapers. They don't listen to radio. They don't watch television and so on. And still they had the exact same reactions. And mm. that killed all these flimsy explanations and all the physicians went silent from that point on. And it also introduced very quickly uh, the recognition of electron hypersensitivity as a functional impairment or disability. And that also silenced a lot of the criticism. Uh, there has been in Sweden sort of attacks on electron hypersensitive people after it. But, um, you know, if you, politically would like to kill yourself, then I suggest that you kick a person in a wheelchair oh. and in public TV. Yeah. So the physicians trying to kick the electron hypersensitive people, they just ruin their own reputation and their own career. And nowadays people are protected and, and it's not the Swedish law or anything, it's the United Nations that come into play. They have a special uh, convention regarding the special human rights for people with functional impairments. And they encompass also electron hypersensitivity and multiple chemical sensitivity and so on. And that you should always use when you are attacked because I know people in other countries are under attack from especially the medical doctors, which they hoped should help them, but they don't. I, I think that more and more people have developed electromagnetic sensitivity, but I also think that more and more people have developed, I'll call them reactions. And I wouldn't say that they're electromagnetically hypersensitive in the sense that they are badly affected, but people do say, oh yeah, I get headaches when I use my mobile phone. Or, yeah. oh yeah, I got a pain when I put my mobile phone against my body. Or, oh yeah, I don't, Feel, I, I find it hard to concentrate after I've been on the phone for too long. So I think a lot of people are experiencing unpleasant reactions without yeah. really thinking very much about it. So hopefully yeah. this conversation will encourage them to think, 
oh, well, maybe it could be my mobile phone, my Wi-Fi, my, you know, my smart meter, my smart watch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's try turning them off, disconnecting them, putting a non-wireless alternative in place and see, do you feel any better? And that's going to be a good indication of whether this exposure is affecting you the way you feel. Yeah, I agree to 100%, you know, and I often have uh, stories uh, from persons that have tried to reduce the exp exposure mm -hmm. and coming out in a very nice way. And they thank me for just suggesting it. Of course, it doesn't work for everyone, uh, but for quite a number of people, and also we would like to do a study and we tried to do it many, many years ago. Uh, what we wanted to do was to take a small town in Sweden called Ljungby uh, and um, take away all the exposure, uh, radio, television, cell phones, everything. And over a period of like one or two or three years, we would monitor whether the healthy individuals would become healthier mm. but then we were met with a no we could not do that because and i quote it would not be ethical and i was taught in medical school that the most ethical thing you could do would be to improve someone's health and we wanted to improve 13,746 persons health in Jungby, but no, we were not allowed to do this test. Well, so, I, yeah, so, maybe, sorry. <laughs> no, you go ahead. Well, maybe it's something that people can do for themselves. It's not of going course. to be a clinical trial or anything like that, but it, just try it in your home, see how you go, see what you notice, observe the behavior of kids, because yeah. apart from the, the health problems we've been talking about, there are all sorts of social and relationship problems associated with this exposure Indeed. too. So just give it a go and see what happens. Yeah. And then please tell us, perhaps people can email us or Facebook us and let us know and uh, yeah. we, can, we can share that with you. <laughs> oh, I love what you say, you know, because some years ago there was a fantastic interview program in public Swedish television and they interviewed um, a person that is enormously rich here in Sweden and they asked him, he's a very smart guy, you know, they asked him what would be the best thing to be so very rich. And he immediately say, said, you know, yeah, I don't need to use a cell phone. Oh. And the reporter just went, what, what, what? Yeah, but it's such a destructor of social interaction. Uh, so I don't need it because I have a lot of assistants and they use the cell phone communication, but I don't need it myself. So that I could buy for my money. Mm. So it became a social divider in a sense, you know, and I see that more and more here in Sweden, it's very popular to go on what is called the digital retreat, which should be called a non-digital retreat because you are not allowed to bring any cell phones, laptops, tablets, nothing. And you should just live in a natural way. It's extremely popular, but extremely expensive to spend a week or two at such a retreat. And therefore, again, only for the rich people. Again, a social divider, you know. So, mm, but, but you can do it in your home. Exactly. I mean, just do it. Yes, yeah. just do it. That's right. And it's exciting to see that people are recognizing the benefits of this. And if they're willing to pay money. Yeah, and a lot. To, yes, yeah. that's right. To digitally detox, then obviously that they, they see a benefit. So it must be working. Um, so do you have any suggestions for people who might be watching this today? I know you've already had uh, given us some suggestions, but what would be your key recommendations for people um, as a result of the work that you've done and what we've been talking about today? Well, I think what people need to do is to listen to your programs and similar programs and also educate themselves and start asking these simple questions. A very common question I get from concerned parents is, is this safe for my child? And I have to be honest and tell them, no, it's not. But that's not what authorities would tell them. And therefore I always suggest um, 
you have to address them using questions which they cannot um, avoid or evade. Um, <clears throat> questions that they can only answer with a yes, no, I don't know, or with a number, a figure. So make the questions very simple and don't allow them trying to away their responsibility to answer these questions. And again, a very simple question is, of course, is this safe for my child? And if they say, yes, it's safe, then you should have, you can make a homemade contract, pull it out of your pocket saying, then I don't want you to take a personal responsibility for my child. And if you cannot, then the answer is actually no, it's not safe. It's very interesting. That and so say. far in Sweden, no civil servant has ever signed such a contract. Yeah. Telling you a little bit again. Well, it's very interesting. I think it's a very similar thing in Australia. If you write to um, certain administrators and ask them about you know, safety of radiation from a mobile phone tower, et cetera, et cetera, I can almost predict word for word what they'll say, but they don't actually answer the, the question. No using the, the, the terms that are, are relevant. So they very neatly yeah. sidestep it. So yeah. that's something for people to be aware about. Yeah, but so, I, I think it, to educate oneself and not be afraid of um, starting to brush your teeth with an ordinary toothbrush and maybe put aside the fun cell phone and the fun tablet and the fun laptop, at least for a few hours a week and try to reduce the exposure. And instead, um, buy yourself a dog or a cat or a goldfish or a flower pot or something and be out into nature. And uh, when people, you know, run around with their V, is it called VR glasses on, you know, I say, take them off and uh, be in reality instead. That's much more fun for you. Uh, well, so, yeah. It's also That's, much more important. <laughs> yeah, it's so much yeah. important, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and, but, you know, again, there are kind of glimmers of hope. I regularly go to Finland to a town called Uliobori or Olio in Finnish. Uh, and that's, um, among many things, a center for the development of the Internet of Things. Uh, and what people there tell me and have told me the last two, three years is that no, uh, the internet of things will probably not fly very well at all because the consumers, they are saturated. They don't want to have more apps in the phone and they don't want their toaster or refrigerator to call them and telling them that they need to buy milk or something. And the tech nerds, they're so few, so you cannot build a market uh, only on those few consumers. And maybe they say uh, autonomous vehicles maybe could be something, but even there, I hear them uh, being um, hesitant. And also they tell me that a lot of companies as well as uh, risk capitalists have withdrawn their money from this particular area of industry. Uh, so maybe the consumers, and, and, and that's, not, that's not the maybe. I mean, um, you asked me what, what could your listeners do? I mean, the consumer power is enormous. I remember when I went to the European Union once at the meeting, and then I asked them, um, if they were sort of governed by all the lobbyists and they were afraid of the lobbyists and so on, you know, and this uh, parliamentarian said, no, 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 we can handle them. There's only one factor we're afraid of. Uh, yeah, what's that? Well, that's the citizens. The moment uh, the consumers and the citizens says no to something, then it's over. And a few years later on, Brexit. So he was right. Uh, the moment consumers slash citizens uh, decides, then they could start or kill any area of society easily, but they need to have the guts to do it. And uh, I think your viewers and listeners, they do have the guts, but they need to be more in number, of course. 
Yes, I think it's it's just a question of what we choose to buy largely, isn't it? Because yeah, I remember yeah. years ago you couldn't buy um, gluten-free or anything, biscuits or bread exactly. or whatever it is. And and now that's very popular because people have demanded it. There was there were no vegan restaurants when I was young or vegetarian restaurants. And and there are now. So it's what people where people put their money that we see change. So if people don't want wireless technology, they just have to buy non-wireless yep. technology. Yeah. And and manufacturers will respond. And I'd just like to remind people too that the reason that we have Internet of Things is not because it's a great idea for consumers. It's because it's a great idea for manufacturers because they can sell more wireless products. To yep. They're selling wireless to machines now, not just people. Yep. So it expands yep. their market. It, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a great yep. idea. <laughs> so, well, that's, that's good. I think that gives us some encouragement for the future some tips about what we can do and some very good reasons why we should do these things so ollie i'd like to very very much thank you for your time this evening well and, the same and, and and for me it's the morning you know it's the evening <laughs> for you but it's early morning here well not so early any longer it's uh, uh, 12 minutes past 11 and uh, so it's soon lunch time uh, but it's a lovely, lovely day here with sunshine oh. and hopefully some more warmth because it has been a rather cold spring here and very rainy too. Oh. Uh, so we are looking forward to the sun. Well, and I... the sun you find outdoors. I have to remind everyone, not in your cell phone. It's outdoors. <laughs> yes, don't look, don't look at pictures of the sun. Go out and no, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, you have a, a lovely day. Enjoy the sunshine. And hopefully we'll talk again soon. Yes, I would love to. Thank you so much, Lynn. And bye-bye. Thank, thank you, Ali. Bye-bye.